All right, what up, y'all? This is Coach Reese, and welcome to Practice the Podcast. I'm super excited for this episode because we have, one, we have our first guest, our first special guest, um, who is actually a really good friend of mine. And so I'm excited to just hop into the conversation. I'm going to introduce her, um, and I'm going to let her just tell us about herself and how dope she is. But as you know, here at Practice the Podcast, we fuse research and culture to help you grow and pretty much living out your purpose with confidence, helping you develop the mindset, habits, and skills to get after. And today is no different. So welcome to the podcast, Ashley Roberts. What's good? What's up? What's up? I'm excited to be here. I can't wait to dive into the conversation. Um, I, I'm proud of you. I will say that I'm proud of this podcast. I can't wait to hear all the guests that you all have on and all the topics you got. Look, y'all, let me let me redo this intro real quick just so I can give you guys a better idea of who it is, because I know who we're talking to, but I, I need you guys to know. Ashley Roberts, Sierra entrepreneur, uh, two-time author, real estate investor, speaker, basketball coach, friend, home, uh, just all of the above, daughter, she she all that, right? And it's it's important for me to list all that for you guys to know who Ashley is, because as we dive into this conversation, you're really going to get to know her, but you're going to see some Black excellence on display. So if you're somebody who's like, man, I want to know how I can do real estate. I want to know how I can do it all. I want to know how I can manage a life and be, you're how old, Ashley, real quick? 31. There, psh, come on. So right here, this, this episode is going to give you all the game that you need in order to really build out the life that you want to live. So Ashley, the first question I want to ask you is, what does it feel like to be you? That's a good question. Um, I mean, obviously I love being me, um, but, but to me, to be me, you, you gotta be strong. Um, you have to be able to, um, lean on people, have the courage to step out of, out of fate. Um, I think that's, that embodies me. I'm gonna always step out and try new things, do new things, meet new people. Um, I'm a networker. So I think when when somebody thinks of Ashley, they're gonna think of a networker. Um, I think that's what it feels like to be me. You know, somebody that's loving, somebody that cares, have a good heart, and gonna always thrive in business. Here's the thing about that: all that's 100 percent true. No smoke. Like we've been in airports, and I've seen you talk to random people. It doesn't matter if they're like 85 or 15, uh, race, ethnicity, gender, like none of that matters. And you are really like the network queen, the, the social capital queen. Like I've seen you actively get out there with no fear. And that's something that I've appreciated from you. Really have been inspired by like, okay, boom, what would Ashley do? Like if I got these books, I got to get out here and hustle them. And that to me is one of my favorite, one of, one of my many favorite characteristics about you because a lot of people are afraid to have conversations. Why is that something like you don't fear talking to strangers? Um, One, I think because I love talking to people. I think that's the biggest thing. And I'm a big, you don't know until you, if you don't ask. You don't know what you don't know. So if I got a goal of something, you, you mentioned the books. Um, Sometimes I like to set challenges for myself. I don't need anybody else to really challenge me. I'll set a challenge for myself. So one of the things I'll do is, okay, I want to sell 15 books. Well, if I got to sell these books, I'm going to have to talk to people that I don't know. Um, it also helps me. One of my big goals is to get back into speaking. Um, and I use that as a way of, yes, I'm going to hit the goal. Yes, I'm going to meet somebody new and I'm be able to impact them with my book. But I'm also working on my speaking and working on talking to strangers, somebody who don't even know me, seeing how I can hold a conversation with them, seeing how I can grasp their attention to ultimately get them to their end goal or my end goal of buying the book and their end goal of getting the book. Okay. So uh, y'all are obviously catching this game right off the top, right? You said it takes in order to be you is to be strong. I'm going to circle back to that. So we didn't forget that, but you're really, again, speaking on a point that a lot of people are afraid of this challenge you talk about. Number one, being challenged in the first place. Number two, talking to other people, um, what is it that you feel like empowers you to do that? Have you always been like this? Have you Were you always that kid who just ran around and had conversations and didn't care who it was and sought out challenges? Or this was this something you had to grow and develop in? I would say a little bit of both. I've always been the person that would talk to, you know, people. Most times it, it would be my own friends. Um, but when I was younger, I would say I think that was sixth grade, sixth or seventh grade. 
it was a time that I got hurt and nobody really talked to me. And I, I remember that feeling of like being out and nobody really kind of conversed with me. And I didn't, I wanted to be that person to other people where if I'm out, if I see somebody and you even mentioned earlier, oh, whatever, I typically would go to the older people. I love going to like really like older people because at times I feel like that they could be the lone, like the lonely ones. And I want to have those conversations with them. So I think that it's a little bit of both. Like I've always been the type of person I'm going to get out. I'm going to talk to people. I'm going to have fun. Um, but I also had to grow into, let me get out of my comfort zone. And once I got out, that's why I'm big on getting out of your comfort zone. Once I got out of my comfort zone of talking to people that I didn't know, like I can do that all day. And I prefer to do that because I meet new people. Um, but I think it's something that you also have to grow into. See, okay. I want to take what you just said. And anybody who knows me knows I'm like, I'm always trying to flip something yeah. in a way. Because what you just said about, right, the comfort zone and then something to grow into, I like to see it as stretching and or expanding our comfort zone, mm -hmm. right? So instead of stepping out, you are now doing something and like, this is a part of your lifestyle. So from the outside looking in, especially for me, I'm like, she's mad comfortable talking to folks. She's mad comfortable engaging with anybody, like- you sell yourself. When I think of you, I think of um, Mark Cuban. Um, I had the opportunity of seeing him speak last week or a couple of weeks ago at Afrotech. And he was just talking about how like he just, like you have to sell your product. And he was talking about one of the new businesses he has. And he kept saying it and kept saying the website and kept, and he's like, you guys do know you are the ones who are supposed to sell your business, right? And I just think it's so funny how a lot of folks, but you, you like, why are you sell Like, I'm supposed to sell my stuff. <laughs> if I don't sell my stuff, who will, right? Mm -hmm. So it depends on the type of person, but I say that to say you make sell, and it's not you selling your stuff, you're really selling love. And I say that because I know you, right? You're really selling your passion, um, but you look comfortable doing it. So I like to frame it as, I don't want to step out of my comfort zone. I want to stretch my comfort zone because mm -hmm. when I stretch my comfort zone, it enables me to be able to do things that were once difficult because now I'm now comfortable doing difficult things, right? I need to be able to take certain things that are within me to be able to stretch my thought process, my philosophy, my skills, knowledge, resources. And now my comfort zone is way bigger than what it used to be. So when I go and I'm doing new things, I get to expand my comfort zone that much more versus having to step out and never really going back in. And I say that as a compliment because you make these things look like it's just, it's, it's second nature to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I like that analogy. I like the, the difference of that, of just stretching. You're just stretching yourself. Word, word, so you can grow into it. So before we get to you here, you used to be, a you our Hooper used to be Hooper. Once a Hooper, always a Hooper, right? Yeah. So you're originally from Dallas. Now you're based in Austin. So tell us about just that journey of being a Hooper because you talked about that, right? You got hurt. Um, and, you know, co coaching is a big part of what you do now. Tell us about that journey from being a Hooper in high school, middle school to, you know, playing at UT to what you're doing now with Competitive Edge. Yeah, for sure. So from Dallas, went to Duncanville High School. Um, I think everybody knows about Duncanville, or I would say that um, Powerhouse High School. Unfortunately, I did not win a state championship while I was there. So. But it's okay. We set the foundation. We laid it out for forever. That's what I like to say. We I was a part of the foundation. Um, but I went to Duncanville High School. I tore my ACL my junior year in high school. And it was like I went from I was getting highly recruited, all the Big 12 schools. And that was always my goal to be in a Big 12. Um, I tore my ACL and all of that went away. And at that time, I, I didn't – now, being a coach, I understand it. Um, but I didn't realize, like, dang, like, they didn't even care about me. Um, but at the end of the day, they had to move on to the next person. Our class was one of the toughest classes in guards, for sure. Um, but after that, I had a conversation with my AAU coach, Coach Mudd. He's passed away now. Um, and he advised me to go JUCO. And I was just like – Knew nothing about JUCO, none of that. And I had, I still had D1 offers, um, but I personally wanted to be in the Big 12. And it's not like how now we got the transfer portal and all of that. Um, but, you know, he called me Ash Mama. He was like, I think that you should go JUCO, get your knee strong um, and see what happens from there. Ended up taking his advice. I didn't even, 
look up junior colleges. It's still a funny story. I still like to talk about is um at Duncanville, Coach Lovato was at Grayson Community College. She would come up to Duncanville all the time talking to me um about Grayson. And I would be like, I'm not going to no Grayson. Like, I don't even know what that is. But and they ended up going to the national championship while I was at South Plains, by the way. <laughs> but um I didn't really do any research. Cheryl Swoops was my favorite player and she went to South Plains. So I literally told my high school coach, like, Cheryl Swoops went to South Plains, I'm gonna go to South Plains. Called her, we went up there. Um, I went on a visit. They offered me, went to South Plains, had a pretty good year at South Plains. After my first year, I was actually going to go to Baylor, um, but it just wasn't the right fit. And something told me to go back. Um, it was out of Baylor and, and North Texas, actually. I don't even remember what happened, but it was something with uh, paperwork and all of that where it didn't work out with North Texas. Anyways, went back to South Plains. From there, um, I had committed to Arkansas. Um, and then last minute, um, Texas, the Texas coach who was at North Texas got the Texas job. Um, and they called me and it just, it just felt right. So committed to Texas, went to Texas, was there my last two years. And, um, uh, while some will probably like to say like, you know, me, I didn't play a whole lot cause I got hurt again. So I got hurt my junior year in high school. I got hurt my junior year in college. So ACL high school mm. microfracture surgery college. Yeah. And I think that it was really a blessing in disguise because I've always wanted to be a coach. I always said that I'd be a high school coach when I finished. And I was able to, I was put in a position to really be a coach. I got my school paid for, still was on the team, obviously still, you know, did everything. But like my coach would allow me to, to come in some of their coaches meetings and to kind of see the back end of recruiting, which is why I also know a lot about recruiting them. Um, so I was able to do that while I was at Texas. Once I finished, uh, I thought I wanted to go get my master's. Um, and I said, well, I did want to go get my master's. And I said, I only want to be in the Big 12. I was being picky. Um, that first year, everybody kind of had somebody in it that they had one more year left. So I went to go to Dessau Middle School. I was the head coach there. Um, really, I was like, I'm just going to buy some time, get a job, do this and that. After that first year, I also I went to Cedar Creek High School. So I was the head varsity coach there for two years. And I when I thought I wanted to be a high school coach, that that changed quickly. Um, and I think it was I think it was honestly very grateful for the opportunity. Um, but I think it might have been just the school. Wrong, wrong school, you know. Um, but everything happens for a reason. So I enjoyed my time there. Um, we went to playoffs. I first year, my first year coaching was that first time going to playoffs. So that was pretty exciting. Um, after that, I finally was like, you know what? I'm gonna do this on my own. I was still training and doing things on the side while I was at Cedar Creek. And then I took that leap of faith, I had literally no idea what I was. Only thing I was doing was training. So I didn't really know what I was going to do, but train and then stuff started falling into place. That's why I'm a big believer. Like when you actually like take a step, God's going to lead you. So stuff started falling into place. Like I randomly reached out to my old AAU director. and was like, hey, I think I want to run a lead. Don't know why I thought to run a lead. And he was like, you should do it. He started giving me some stuff. And I started looking around. I looked at the two leagues that was going. It was two leagues, two, three leagues, but two that a lot of people played at. And one, a lot of teams went to because it was cheap, but it wasn't organized. And then another one, it just wasn't as competitive. So I was like, I'm going to come in between both of them. And had no, literally had no idea. I didn't even have teams at that time. So I had no idea. But I knew if I was able to get like, one program that was like people knew respect it was pretty good I would get the rest so literally like I like you see me do with these books I did on the phone so I called I got online looked at every tournament that went on in the summer got coaches names emails heard a whole bunch of no's because nobody knew me I didn't even have a team and they weren't finna get in a new league and one program CTX Knights I'm so grateful for them always grateful for them he was like I'll, I'll try it yeah, I think he had like 18. So I was able to say CTX Knights is playing. And then I got ATX Future. And then I got Rim Rockers. And those three were like the three big programs at the time. 
And first year league, I had 42 teams and I thought I was on top of the world because I just could not believe that I literally did that. Um, and then now, fast forward to now, this year we had 123 teams. You know, so, you know, had the league going and then I think everything else just kind of fell into place with the book, um, coaching, training. I was coaching AAU in other programs. And again, I'm very big on just finding a need. Um, loved each program that I coached with, but I just always felt like there was something missing. Um, and that's kind of where the teams came in and then building a female mm -hmm. empowerment. You know, I'm very big on that having a program to where it's not only me being a female director, but all the coaches are former college players um, and women, you know, being able that, so that young girls can see someone that look like them, you know, being able to have a female role model. I think in an AAU, there's just a lot of men, um, uh, you know, predominantly men, you know, as majority men coach AAU and I, and nothing's, you know, wrong with that per se, but I do think that, women need to be in the game. And I wanted to find a way to bridge that gap um, that women can coach and enjoy coaching it. Um, so that's a little bit about from high school to now. Yo, we could really take this episode a couple different ways. Like the, we could talk hoop, obviously, obviously we talk right on a weekly basis. So we could really chop it up from a hoop stance. But what I love though, and I'm going to put me into this as well because we're, we're similar is like, and I think this is why we have a similar passion for young women hoopers is because the trajectory is yeah. crazy. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, the amount of stuff that like, yes, you were a hooper, so you could speak to hoopers and you're a coach, you could speak to coach, but like right. your resume on everything else that you do though, but it started the adversity from what I hear started from when you, you know, first got hurt. Yeah. Right when you was in middle school and then high school. So like yeah. you literally, when you're talking about these people that you talk to in the airport, you're selling books and you're like, man, I've been hurt before. So as an athlete, I think athletes are some of the most amazing people because we've been able to live dreams, accomplish, lose, win, succeed, fail, all of those different things by the time you get to your senior year of high school. So many people don't have those kind of experiences. You know what I'm saying? And I think that that is why, you know, I think that's why we right, have a similar heart, obviously, when it comes yeah. to um, young women, um, the young black and brown women, especially Hoopers, just all of that and being able to be like, yo, especially when you have a young mind that you can be like, look at the, how you could be an entrepreneur. Look at how you yeah. can become a businesswoman thinking the same way you think as a captain, right? Yeah. The way you think as a captain is the same way you think as an entrepreneur and the fact that you can train that. And then you got NIL deals and everything else now. So, you know, I definitely don't want to hone in on the hoop part, but I think I'll say from my sub experience, like I am who I am because I was a hooper because I am a hooper. And I hear that in your story, like you can handle everything that you've got going on because you were a hooper, right? So you're an entrepreneur because you were a hooper. You know what I'm saying? Like you're able to do all these things because the AU side and league is business. Yeah. That's not, you know what I'm saying? You could just do that and not even coach. And it's literally just business. So um, I definitely want to commend you on um, embracing adversity throughout your entire time, right? At just the JUCO. I played in coach JUCO. So we don't even got to go there. <laughs> played in coach. So we didn't even got to go there. I understand it. So to make it out of there, to make it to, you know, the big 12, play at Texas and then still get hurt and still persevere to go get your master's and start a league like, None of that stuff that she just mentioned, y'all, is none of it's easy. None of it's light work. So let's fast forward. You're here now. You've got league. You've got teams. Um, you're speaking. You're about to get that back up. So if somebody is a speaker, make sure you um, catch her info and hire. Bring her in so she can speak and motivate anybody at this point. Um, but I want to talk about your book, your new mm -hmm. book, your new release, like, tell us about the little girl with big dreams because oh she is you. You smiled when you just said that. I wonder if I have it. I don't even know. You got to have it with you. She is you. If you don't have it, we're definitely going to make sure we drop the uh, the link yeah. in the description. And we're at a photo on there, all that stuff, so people can see it. So while you're looking for it, um, I just have to commend Ashley on this process. Um, to see it go from vision to fruition has been 
amazing to be on this journey with you. And thank you for allowing me to be on this intimate journey with you. So you got the book. You got to show us the little girl with have, big dreams. I, I don't, but I will have it before we get off. I don't have the book, okay. in my back, but I will have it. But Okay. But so tell us about it. Yes. The little girl, big dreams. That's, that's my baby. Like I'm smiling so hard now when you said that. Um, little girl with big dreams is about an ambitious girl um, who is who basically overcomes adversity and every no to hear her yes. Um, at the end of the day, I am very big on while we talk about basketball all day long. I'm very big on using basketball as your vehicle, um, which kind of goes into my first book. And the little girl with big dreams is this little girl who's dreaming. You know, it's not really basketball. You're you're dreaming about whatever you want to do. People are telling you no. Uh, people are interrupting your dreams or whatever it is, and you overcome it to see it, see to see the bigger picture at the end. Um, so I'm super, super excited about the little girl with big dreams. I've gotten so many good reviews from it, and I can't wait to get that book in every little girl's hands. Um, you know, it's been exciting. Of course, the book is tailored towards the little girl, the little girl with big dreams. That that was me. I was that little girl. Um, but what I have loved about it so far is that I've had adults reading it like, you know, this book was for me. You know, I've had literally just yesterday, someone told me like, because they, they're they getting the books now. Somebody told me yesterday that after they finished reading the book, they went and applied for the job that they've been looking to apply and they got it. And I'm like, what the heck? Like, so, I mean, just the simple, like that book, like it's for these little girls, but it's truly for anybody who has a dream, who's been sitting on their dreams, who feels stuck, like who wants to do something new like that. That's what the book is for. And I think that it's tugging on people because you literally see like a little girl and it's a true story. You know, the book is based off a true story. So you see this little girl who wants something so bad, who wants to um, sell candy. Like that's all she want to do is sell candy. Right. So she wants to do that so bad. And she's told no. And she's told she can't do it here. She can't do it here, there. And she doesn't just stop at no. Like most people will just be like, OK, well, they said I can't do it. I can't do it. Um, she doesn't stop at no. She keeps going and she perseveres and she gets a big reward at the very end of the book. You know, so I think for me, a lot of people can resonate with that. You know, a lot of people will start something. A lot of people will, oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. And if they first know, they done. Um, and for me, with kids in particular, it's hard about a day. You know, I, I think that it's very difficult for kids to hear the word no. They don't know how to react when they hear the word no. Um, versus using that no into next opportunity, using that no to push you towards getting a yes. So that, that's the purpose of the book. I'm so excited about the book. I can't wait to get this book in every school. That's my goal is to get this in every school possible. I want the book in every library possible um, so that people can read it. So dope. I want to go back to what you just said is using your using the no to get to a yes. Tell us more about like that piece, using a no to get to your yes. Because even in this next journey for you to get it into every yeah. school possible, you gonna hear it's either a whole lot of crickets or no's, but the yeses, right? So how are you going to go about this journey of using your no to get to the yeses? Networking, doing what I do best, um, you know, doing mm -hmm. all the work, looking up schools, emailing schools, using my own network. Um, I think for me, I know a lot of different coaches and different schools and it's about finding the right person that's going to mm -hmm. give you a yes. So for me personally, I'm going to get to the coaches of, OK, can you connect me with your principal? Um, because that's to me who's going to be able to get me the yes. Um yeah giving them books, free books, you know, finding different ways. So to answer that no to a yes, it's finding different ways to get to your yes, you know, being mm -hmm. creative with getting to your yes. It may be me having to um, give some free books out. It may be me having to drive up somewhere and personally meet, you know, with the principal. It may mm -hmm. be me trying to figure out what, what these principals like so I can send them a quick gift, you know, anything, like anything that I need to do. And I think that that's the biggest thing is like, figuring it out at the end of the day, like not stopping until you figure it out and getting creative. You're going to hear no's. To me, mm -hmm. if you don't like in some part of your journey, there's going to be people saying, no, no, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. Um, 
sorry, that kind of, can you bring that book in? Um, no, you can't do these certain things. To me, it gets you closer to the yes. You know, you're going to eventually, if you keep going, if you keep working at it, you're going to eventually hear the yes. And going back to that book, like that was the little girl. That was Ashley. She kept hearing no. And it's like, I'm, I'm going to get my yes. Like, I want to sell candy. So I'm going to sell candy one way or another. So. I love it. I love it. And I love that it gives you, right, the second I said it, it gives you organic energy, right? Like the organic <laughs> smile, the organic energy, like that's that's how you know, like that points to your purpose, that points to uh, your passions in life. When you can just think about something and it puts a smile on your face, you know, like that's how, that's just what certain things and people um, do for me. And I can see that on your your face, like the girl, little drink, like it's just there and it's been energy the whole way through. And I can say as somebody who's on this journey with you, it has not. Look, look at the energy. <laughs> it has not been an easy one. So uh, do you got the book? You want to show us the book? There it is. This is the book. Look at it. This is back to so fire. Yes. So fire. And it's been a process. So question two is what keeps you motivated? A lot of things keep me motivated. One, just personally, I think I'm a, like, I personally motivate myself. I talked about earlier of like challenging myself. Um, there are things that I want to achieve um, for my own good and for my family's good. Like um, I'm pretty much the first entrepreneur in my family, you know, so wanting to show other people that it, it is possible, like you can step out um and accomplish your dreams Two, trying to show that yes I'm a full-time entrepreneur but I've kind of shifted my mindset of like you know entrepreneurship is not for everybody like everybody cannot be an entrepreneur and that's okay but I do believe that everybody should have another source of income you know so I think that's kind of what keeps me motivated honestly is one being able to show my family that you don't have to just wake up, go to your job, go to sleep, come home, wake up, do it again. Like, enjoy life, live life. So me traveling, me doing different things, like, I want to show them. And my ultimate goal is to be able to do different things where I'm taking my whole family on a trip, paid for. You know, I can't do that until I make money, right? <laughs> you know, I have to have the funds and the resources to be able to do that. So I want to be able to take my whole family on trips. I want to be able to just sporadically, like, my brother, that's like my biggest role model you know so I want to be able to take him like hey let's just go let's go to Miami let's do these yes so it's a lot of different things that I think I want to do and it's what keep me motivated um I honestly also on the flip side is all the people who think that I can't do it um you know oh she can't do this or she won't do that or this like that motivates me like that motivates me um, my program, seeing all the little girls, like knowing that they're looking up to me, like that motivates me. Like, I really want to show people that like, there is no age limit. You know, if you want to do something, every single thing, and it's crazy. I was thinking about this last night when I was in a little funk, you know, but I had to think and be grateful and thankful that everything that I've asked for, that I pray for, I, I have, like, mm -hmm some things I didn't even know how I would do it. and I'm like dang like I pray for this and I, I actually have it you know and I think sometimes like I had to take a step back of like just being grateful like everything might not be perfect but I have it all right and anything that I've prayed for anything I've asked I, I'm getting it I'm doing it so I want to be able to show like other people like that's kind of what motivates me to be able to show other people that put in the work and you're going to get it. Like nothing is going to be easy. You know, you're going to face adversity. You're going to do these different things. And like all of that motivates me. Like I get asked a lot, like, when are you going to stop? When are you done? And I don't plan, like, it's going to always be something, you know, and that's just me. Like once I finish one project, I'm on to the next. Like I want to keep building. Like it's an empire that I want to build. You know, I eventually want to have kids. So I want to have kids. I want to set my kids up where they're walking into something. You know, they they have something and it's their choice if they want it or don't want it. You know, I want to be able to have kids that I'm not stressing out about the next bill or, or whatever. Like, it's good. It's taken care of. 
I can live my life. My family can live their life. My kids can live their life. There is no stressing. So like those are the things that motivate me. Word. So how do you handle the haters? I'm working on that. Okay. Honestly, I think that's a working process. I am an emotional person. Um, I am a people person. So at the end of the day, like people can say, oh, I don't care what people say or this and that. I can be honest and say, I care. Like, I care. <laughs> so that is something that's a work in process. Um, but dealing with that is talking to people like you, talking to people like my family when I can vent and say this happened or this happened and I can cry. I'm not going about my business. You know, I've learned that if they're not saying anything, you're not doing anything. So I think that's kind of how I deal with haters. One is to keep keep going because if something's been said, that means you're doing something right, you know, and learning how to get out my feelings. Um, I think it's, it's kind of how I handle it now, but it's it's definitely a working process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, because when you think about all stories, any story, maybe not the little, even the little girl with big dreams, whether it's her or it's Spider-Man or it, it just, it doesn't, there's always opposition, right? There's always going to be some type of opposition when you have a hero. Somebody's only a hero if there's a villain. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? There's, we only know that light exists because darkness exists, right? And vice versa. And so to try to not embrace haters, excuse me, whatever your embrace means and, and looks like, and I think that you're doing a fabulous job with it. I think it is, it's difficult because like you said, you're a people person. It's like, I, like, what did I, I'm just out here trying to help. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that that's something that a lot of people can learn from because there will be, and I think sometimes too, before I say that is we put too much emphasis on the hater themselves, mm -hmm. right? Versus being able to say what you just said is like, okay, they must be doing this because I'm doing this. And if I'm doing this, there has to be opposition. There's mm -hmm. always going to be opposition. And you're not for everybody. We're not for everybody. Everything is not for everybody, right? Even chicken ain't for everybody. That's why there's vegans and vegetarians. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> like, like in vice versa. So there's the, the world is vast majority of so many different things that the same is for us. Not every person or everything or every project is for every person, but it because we're humans with emotions, it makes it harder for us to be able to, um, I think, swallow that sometimes. Swallow the, why don't you like me? Swallow the, why won't you support me? Especially if I didn't do nothing to you. That's that's it. That's it. I don't know. But then the other part that I have to say to myself is like, okay, bet. If I didn't do nothing to you, which means I like, I personally, there's some people I've offended, 100%. I've done some things, right? Okay, cool. I get why you don't like me. But I don't get why you don't like me. If I did nothing to you, then that must then that must mean it's simply for the fact that I trigger something in you that reflects back on you and your lack and your insecurity or your lack of confidence or whatever whatever it is. So I say this to you as um, a supporter, a fan, as a friend. Keep doing you right, like keep moving because all you're doing is being the light that God created you to be, and so be out here and do your thing and shine light where you're supposed to. And yeah, you're supposed to have haters, right? You're supposed to have opposition. You're supposed to have people that don't rock with you and your story. So keep doing it. And the dopest part about it though, is they will reveal themselves and you'll yeah. know, you'll have clarity on who the folks are that I, that I don't need to be doing life with. I don't believe and keep the whole, you know, uh, enemies close, friends close, enemies closer. That makes zero sense to me. Um, <laughs> You know, like I need my enemies as far. My enemies should not be able to get past my friends is how I like to see it, right? Because your friends should be able to say it. But, you know, stay stay surrounded. And it sounds like you've got a good village around you. So um, I'm just proud. Like proud is just the best way that I can, you know, sum up how I feel about you. And I think about you. It puts a smile. Like I'm excited to see you grow. I know that this is definitely, I don't even want to say just the beginning because you've done so much to get here. Like you've done a lot in the last decade, right? And in the 20 years prior to this last decade to get this spot. So this is still, you know, like that first, second quarter of a of a game that's got like eight different overtimes. You yeah. know what I'm saying? <laughs> and you come out being the victor on top, which is going to be the, the dopest thing ever. So as we wind down, I have a couple questions. 
uh, we're going to go into our skills and drills session, right? Our skills and drills part of the episode. This is practice where we fuse research and culture, uh, but practice, you know, like Kobe's not Kobe, but I recently said we talk about practice. Uh, but Kobe said, if practice ain't hard, like what's the point? And so I want you to be able to give our listeners um, what's something of value that they can add to their life that they can practice in order to be able to be their best selves? A routine. That That is key. I think a routine, getting a routine, whatever a routine looks like for you. Um, I think when people hear routine, they think it has to be a certain way. Um, and I think you should practice that, like finding out what works for you. I think we we personally talk a lot of, or I'm like, how you get up that early? And you're like, how you up that late? Like, <laughs> what works for you don't work for me. And what works for me don't work for you. So I think that finding out what works for you, um, getting a routine, sticking with a routine, and being okay if you get off of a routine. I read in a book, uh, I my mind is going blank. I cannot remember which book it was, um, but it was talking about routine. And it talked about um, basically, in a sense, being okay with it not getting off of whatever that routine or whatever you have more than two days. So if you mess up that next day, the following day, you should be back on track. And that has helped me tremendously of like, okay, I didn't do this yesterday. Today I got to do it because that's going to be two days in a row. Um, But I think that would be the biggest thing is one, finding out what, I guess two, one, finding out what works for you and two, getting a routine and sticking with it. I love it. Okay. The infamous question that everybody wants to know, how do you do it all? One, a routine, writing (laughs) as much down as I can. And just like, I honestly just feel like I have like, just, I guess grit is the word I can say of just like, I got to get this done, this done, this done. Um, And I will add in great people. Um, That's kind of been the thing that I've focused on really like this year is like breaking my different things into buckets and finding the who's. Um, And that's not free. You know, I'm very big on if people are helping you, like you have to add value to them as well. It should not be people just adding value to you. And that, that could be if that's money, if that's bartering, whatever it is. I personally, I'm big on, I'm gonna pay you the money and then whatever we need to do after that, we'll do it. But that's probably been the hardest thing. I mean, I've lost money this year because I felt it that important to find people that can help me, pay these people that can help me um, so that I can continue to grow, that I can continue to start to take things off my plate um, because mm-hmm. doing it all is not fun all the time. Like, um, I, I honestly do love it because I love everything that I'm doing. I don't love every piece of the businesses that I do. And I think that's my biggest thing is those things that I don't love doing. All right, let's get people in place because I one, I don't love doing them and two, I'm not good at them. So um, it's, it does no good for me to try to do it all and do things that I'm not great at um, versus having people that can help with that, offload some things and that I can move into other directions. Word, yeah, those are huge. And I, I love asking this question because how everybody does it is different. Yeah. Right. So that's their like, and you're at a space. I remember, I love that you said it because I remember, ooh, we probably, it was a minute ago. You were like, you got any books on delegation? (laughs) (laughs) So to hear you now implementing it, that's a big deal. You know what I'm saying? And what I, again, what I think is so great about you is you're a learner and not just a learner, but you apply what you learn. You, you stay hungry. Um, for knowledge. And that's a big deal, but knowledge and application. So which leads me to my next question is, what are you reading right now? Uh, Who, not how. I've already read that book, but I'm reading it again. And you owe you. You owe you. Oh, yeah. Uh, E.T. OK. Who, not how. That's my primary book. Who, not how. It's just a, I like to pick a book um, towards the end of the year that I've read and I enjoyed and just kind of go back. And so I'm not necessarily reading it. I'm kind of skimming through it and seeing what I like, looking at my notes. Um, but the primary book is E.T.'s book, You Owe okay. Me. Um, How often do you read? Every day. So um, the way that I like to do, I like to read a book a month. Um, I've kind of gotten into audio books. I don't think it's my thing. Um, but I like to read a book a month. So I'll take whatever book it is I'm reading uh, in that month. 
divided up um, by the amount of the days in a month, and that's how many pages I read. So based on how long the book is would be how long I read. Okay, dope. So leaders are readers. That's how you're able to do all the things that you do. Um, get a routine and make sure that you do your system your way. So yeah. as we close practice, um, I this segment is called Centering the Hum. Okay, Centering the Hum. Three questions, spitfire. I want to hear how you center the hum. Number one, how does practicing humility look like to you? Ooh. Practicing humility. Um, doing for others, I think. Mm. That's what that looks like, doing for others. Okay. What is one of your most humiliating moments? Oh, <laughs> I thought about something. I was like, I don't know if I really want to say this. <laughs> but it's really, it's, I guess you could say that. So I... <laughs> So I have um, a condition called ulcerative colitis. And one of my most humiliating moments is when I use the restroom on myself. So <laughs> it makes you do that. So that was the first thing that came to mind. I'm like, okay, do I want to say that? But I'm going to say that. There we go. <laughs> shout out, shout out to that humility. Um, <laughs> Last one is how do you strive to serve humanity? Um, I would say, I, I mean, I said earlier doing for others, um, but I think one, being grateful for the things I have, serving, uh, serving others, whether that's in the community, whether that's in my program, whether that's with people working with me. Um, being of service, being of service in an overall standpoint. All right. I love it. I love it. Y'all, I I hope that you guys got something amazing out of this. I know that I did. It was great to be in space to celebrate uh, with a good friend of mine. Please make sure that you follow Ashley. Uh, we're going to have her information on everywhere you're going to see it. Um, she's a wealth of knowledge. She's an inspiration. She's a motivation. She is she doing it. Whatever the it is, that's what she is doing um, inconsistently. Like, I got to give you your flowers for being consistent um, at, at a such a young age, right? And I say that in quotations because uh, where you're at now is where, you know, some cats are just getting at 40, 50, 60 or wish that they would have. And so I applaud you for centering humanity and serving and doing what you got to do to live out your dream. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being my first guest on um, practice the podcast where we fuse research and culture to help you develop the mindset, habits, and skills you need in order to live out your purpose with confidence. I'm your host, Coach Reese. Uh, any last words, Ash? I'm proud of you. I'm excited to, to follow your journey of podcasting. Um, I'm excited. I, I appreciate you for allowing me to be your first guest, and I look forward to hearing more episodes. Absolutely. All right, y'all. That's practice for today. Until next time, peace.